right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm not wearing makeup and I just got back from walk, so that's why I don't have my camera on. But um, if you are interested, not if you're interested, whether or not you're interested, get interested because Juana Brionis is super, super cool. And I'm so excited that we're going to be spending this week kind of talking about her as a case study. So um, these are the slides that we will definitely go over in Zoom. But if you're unable to come to Zoom or for whatever reason you can't make it, here is all the tea about this lady's life because she's super cool. Oops. Uh, okay. So, um, in general, we usually learn about people in power or people fighting for power. Um, that's a lot of what gets recorded, whether that is political leaders or um, activists. A lot of the stories we tell, the dominant and counter narrative focus on people who are exceptional for whatever reason. But social history and social historians tell the lives of ordinary people in the past. And it's sometimes harder um, to think about because that not everybody necessarily, you know, has the same kind of records that have been preserved, like, you know, every journal a president ever wrote compared to a factory worker per se, or, you know, even someone who wasn't literate. So it's definitely a different kind of, of history. And so this week, we're going to be looking at the life of a woman who was herself illiterate um, named Juana Briones. And she's really, really cool. Um, and one of the things that really is significant about her is that in her lifetime, she was born when it was still New Spain and a Spanish colony. Um, and she, as she was growing up, uh, Mexico gained independence from Spain, so then she lived in Mexico. And then in the 1840s, 1850, um, California was bought slash forcibly given to the United States from Mexico. And so she also lived in the United States, um, in California. She also, in that amount of time, from 1802 to 1889 was her lifespan, in those 87 years, she also manages to come into the historical archival record several times, and it really gives us an interesting account of a life for a colonial woman during this time. Now, she was born near Santa Cruz, California in 1802. Her parents were part of the 1776 Anza expedition that was an overland expedition bringing colonists to Alta California. And they, of course, like we said a little later, the United States government did the same thing, were lured by the promise of more land, more opportunities, higher pay, that kind of thing. Now, both of her parents were mixed race and the Spanish census records show that they would be, that they both were considered mulatto um, and that she had other close family rec, um, members check mestizo, which were different um, racial classifications in the Spanish North American colonies that had to do with the amount of European, African, indigenous ancestry that a person had and how they would be treated because of it. And so both her parents were mixed race and they were both in general um, because they did not have any affiliations with politics um, or power. They did not, um, they were also not in a very high class of society in general. So she herself had African, European and indigenous ancestry and this was significant. Um, and, and she was, she was just a very average middle class, um, Californian woman at the time. Now, in 1812, when she was 10, her family moved to the San Francisco Presidio from the Santa Cruz area. Eight years later, she married a soldier that was stationed there. Um, I believe his name was Apollinario 
Miranda. I probably totally butchered the first name, but interesting enough, they had 11 children, eight of which survived infancy, and then she also, they also adopted two more. Now, between 1840 and 1846, she reported domestic abuse of her husband 12 times. And in 1844, she petitioned and then was later approved for separation from her husband, which in the Catholic Church, divorce was not allowed. So she got bishops and cardinals and whoever to um, write and get the, I believe it's still required to get the Pope or Vatican's approval for a church sanctioned separation, but she was able to do that, which is really significant for an adult woman at this time to be single and not because she was a widow. Um, she also was a landowner, which is really, really interesting. So after Mexico won independence from Spain, many of the government held lands were redistributed. And because there were shifting um, social and political structures at the time, many women were able to position that to their own advantage. And so because a lot of things were changing, uh, lands were being redistributed. In 1833, she was given a small land grant near the Presidio. At that time, she was still married, so it made sense that they, you know, he was a soldier, so they would be given a small piece of land near the Presidio. Later on, after she was single, she petitioned for land in North Beach, which she was later granted. Um, and then she also bought a rancho down in Los Altos at the same time um, and had a number of different um, Olone indigenous people working that land. Now, this is after the mission system was not really as functional anymore, but most records indicate that at the time, um, most indigenous people did not have the freedom to just walk away from a job like that. It wasn't slavery necessarily um, in what we would think of happening on plantations back east, but it certainly was um, more similar than, say, a, a job that they could just quit if they wanted to, to get a new job. Um, there was definitely less social freedom at the time for indigenous people um, in California. Now, after California became part of the United States, the Americanization of California was very traumatic for many of the Californios that lived there. And many were separated from their land holdings in Alta California, especially in the northern part of Alta California, right? We're going to learn next week more about the gold rush and how there were so many, especially white American settlers coming in. Um, and so all of the racial, social stratification of back east um, and the other larger, more developed part of the United States certainly um, was imposed upon Northern California at the time. And there were um, lots and lots of injustices, let's say. We'll learn more about that next week. But either way, many Californios were separated from their land holdings forcibly. But in 1871, the US government did confirm that she was the rightful landowner and she was able to keep her land. She sold most of her land before her death um, in Palo Alto in 1889. And she, in that time, she never gained any kind of political power. She never became someone that was extraordinarily notable in this way, but she lived a very interesting life and is in the public record in the archives kind of a lot for someone who was not married to someone powerful or powerful in some way herself. And so her life gives us an, a really interesting window into the world of the Spanish, Mexican, and early American California. Um, what was going on, how she and other women lived. And as a non-elite woman who lived the majority of her adult life without a husband, 
her repeated presence in the archives is remarkable. And so that leaves us with the question, what are the strengths and weaknesses of different historical sources on Juana Briones? There are gonna be four different documents we look at from the historical records, and we need to evaluate what we can really find out from those different sources about her life. Um, remember, she was illiterate, so none are technically from her own perspective that did not go through someone else writing down her words or her thoughts. So what are some of the strengths and weaknesses of the documents that we're going to look at? So that is this presentation. And um, yeah, have a wonderful rest of your day. Oh, that's not what I wanted. Um,